Uh, thank you everybody for being here. Um, I am right now in Mexico, so it's very early and I will imagine that it's very early for all of you. So thank you. Thank you for joining the session. Um, well, and thank you, Raoni and, and Jonas, especially, and the rest of the organizers for inviting me uh, to join this event. I am very, very happy to do so. And so first, before I start talking about uh, what I will be speaking in the following 30 minutes, um, a big disclaimer. I am not a physicist. I am not a philosopher of physics. I am a philosopher of science. Uh, but right now I am working on a particular topic, which is scientific understanding. And I and I thought I, I was going to be able to, to say something about quantum mechanics and scientific understanding. So um, if, if you have uh, also, this is the first time that I give this talk. So if you have any comments, any suggestions, they are going to be very much welcome. And again, thank you everybody. So the first thing that I want to say is that this talk is generally inspired by two papers that um, just appeared last year in the book, Scientific uh, Realism and the Quantum, uh, the first and the second chapter actually, which are by Karl Hoeffer and uh, Yuha Tati. So in these two papers, what is being in content is whether we can actually be realist about uh, quantum mechanics, considering all the problems that we already know exist within the theory and the interpretations. And especially these two papers are taking an epistemological side. And so this, this was something that I found really interesting. On the one hand, people like Karl Hoeffer and right now Peter Vickers are claiming that we have ample reasons to exclude quantum theories, meaning uh, the interpretations of, of quantum mechanics, to exclude them from the domain of scientific knowledge that we can regard as established and meaning true knowledge. So what Carl has in mind is that we have certain type of certainties in, in our scientific no, body of knowledge. And so there are certain elements that we have already built and that we have assurance, strong assurance that are going to be true everywhere and that we cannot imagine any scientific theory that um, that is built on the negation of these statements, for instance. And, and this is what he thinks um, is going to be established scientific knowledge. And so when he looks at quantum mechanics, what he says is that we have too many interpretations revealing that we have no clarity about what is going on in the theory, especially in the ontology of the theory. And this is a super highlight for him and says that, um, so we have no established knowledge in quantum mechanics. And while we can say that the theory is very successful and that we get very good predictions and so on, uh, we cannot say that we have any type of epistemic certainty about the content of the theory, especially the ontology of the theory. And so with that in mind, he says, we can be realists about certain domains of other disciplines, but we cannot be justified for having any type of realist commitments towards quantum mechanics. And on the other hand, there, there is the paper by Yuha Satsi in which he claims that, okay, we don't have that type of certainty. He, he also agrees on that, but that we, we still have a certain type of um, justification for having a realist commitment, but it has to be weakened. And so, his idea is that while we cannot point out exactly which are the elements of the theories that are going to be true, we can say that they are reliable because we can find out uh, which is the representational relationship that holds within the theory, uh, the theory and the empirical domain. And so we cannot exactly um, dissect which are the elements that are true and which are the other uh, items that are just going to be helpful, uh, but we can say that given a certain uh, set of information, there are parts over there that are going to hold a strong relationship between uh, a representational relationship between the theory and the empirical domain. So what he is claiming is that our realist commitments are not going to be strongly supported by uh, truth. So they are going to be 
related to this uh, reliability of the representational relationship that holds within the theory, but not to the strong sense of truth. And also, if we if we go back to the um, Carl Schaeffer claim, what he will be claiming is that on the one side, we cannot have this real knowledge, like the strong sense of knowledge uh, and established knowledge in the sciences, in this particular case, in quantum mechanics, but also that, that the theories are too incomplete for us to have a certain type of knowledge. It's not that we cannot get good predictions and that we cannot uh, know facts, but there is a stronger sense of knowledge that we cannot achieve. And so the results of these two papers uh, will give us a, a landscape like this one. On the, imagine that this is going to reflect the epistemology of quantum mechanics. We have very weak beliefs. Um, they might be true, they might be false, they might be justified, they might not be justified. And then we get certain types of knowledge once we get justification and we get access to the truth and, and so on. And so these types of knowledge are going to be very basic, uh, going from objectual knowledge, knowing certain object that is there, uh, factual knowledge, knowing facts, very simple facts. If I get a prediction and it's corroborated, then um, I have factual knowledge about the content of that prediction. But we also will move forward to getting other types of knowledge. For instance, causal explanatory knowledge, which is one of the most valuable epistemic assets uh, in the scientific enterprise. And it seems that there is going to be a point in which we will not be able to move forward, strengthening uh, these epistemic benefits that we get from, from the theories uh, that we are using. And so there is where Carl would say, okay, from here, you cannot move forward to the things that you need for having a rational release commitment. You are not going to be justified because you, you can have these bits of information that you know are true, but you are failing at something. And that something might be to put them together in such a way that they are strong enough and robust enough for us to, um, to consider them to be the basis of our scientific knowledge in the sense of quantum mechanics. So get, um, start keeping that idea in, in mind. I'm going to say a bit more about which type of knowledge would, it, would this be? Uh, but now let's go back to the case of Yuha Satsi. What Satsi is saying is, okay, you can have these beliefs and, and you can achieve all these types of knowledge. And there is going to be uh, like this area that where you will achieve certain type of epistemic goods. And they are going to be enough for justifying a weaker realist commitment. This is maybe less fine grain realist commitment. Um, and it's not really related to truth in the sense that you can point out which are the true elements. But that's going to be all. Because what you are not going to be able to get is this very fine grain um, type of knowledge or type of epistemic access to something that will justify this traditionally strong realist commitments. So this is blocked. And what I want to do here is to explore which is happening in this area in, in which you can get, according to Satsi, weaker realist commitments. And in which, according to Heffer, you will not go through. Where, where According to him, in quantum mechanics, we will not be able to get whatever is justifying Satsi for this weak realist commitment. And my claim here is going to be that what happens there is that we are achieving understanding. And it's going to be a particular type of scientific understanding. But also, it's going to be a type of understanding that will take place under very peculiar circumstances. Or maybe not very positive circumstances. On the one hand, we have to incorporate Hoeffer's claim that the theories are, the content of the theories are very incomplete. So the incompleteness of each of the interpretations of quantum mechanics about uh, which is going to be the ontology. Also, we have to incorporate Satz's claim that uh, this thing that is that we are obtaining is not strongly related to truth. And so. That's why uh, it is called the meta aim. And 
In the following slides, in the following minutes, I want to address two main questions. Can physicists achieve legitimate understanding of quantum mechanics? And if so, how is this possible? This is, which is happening here? Can we show Karl Heffer that we actually can move forward from, from the point that he said, this is the end? And if so, which is the epistemic good that we are going to get and how we are going to get it? And so the plan is going to be the following. The talk is going to be divided in four parts. Uh, the first part, I will say something about uh, the preliminaries and understanding and a bit more of quantum mechanics um, in general. Then I'm going to move very briefly to sketch a primitive ontology based methodology uh, for the achievement of scientific understanding. And then I'm going to say which are going to be the understanding related virtues of such methodology and whether this can help us to achieve any, any understanding under these circumstances, um, incorporating the incompleteness and the not close relation to truth. And then I'm going to go to some final remarks. So first, Scientific understanding has been traditionally considered to consist of knowledge about relations of dependence and it says that when one understands something, one can make all kinds of correct inference about it. Scientific understanding traditionally has been regarded to be both factive and explanatory. On the, on the one hand, it is often regarded to be as explanatory, meaning that it comes only after achieving uh, causal explanatory knowledge but they do not collapse. It's not the same thing. So, uh, but it is needed according to the, a traditional view to get first causal explanatory knowledge about the phenomenon and then you start relating all these explanations that you get and you get a, a type of scientific understanding, which is often called causal scientific understanding. And then if one asks, where is this requirement coming from? Particularly in, in the empirical sciences, this requirement of explanatoriness is, um, is coming from the epistemological grounding role that we think causal explanations play in the sciences, especially in the empirical sciences. On the other hand, as I was saying, uh, scientific understanding is often regarded as factive, meaning that the content of understanding can only include true propositions. And there's a huge debate in the philosophy of science whether uh, this is the case, or if we can incorporate things that are not true uh, and that we know are not true. And so um, there are going to be different standpoints, three major standpoints. One that is the factivist one, which says that only true propositions can be part of the content of understanding. There is a quasi-factivist view that will say that only true propositions can be part of the content of understanding, but they have to be accompanied by things that might not be true, that might be the result of abstractions, idealizations, and so on and so forth. And so they are needed uh, for, for instance, inferential reasons. They are going to aid the process of achieving understanding, but they are not going to be part of the content of the understanding. And there is a non-factivist view, which might claim that uh, non-true things can be included in the content of understanding. But, uh, and so if, if one looks at this constraint, the factivist constraint, one would wonder, where is it coming from? And the main motivation is that we want a certain type of truth preservation. If we have very high quality uh, content, we want it to remain that way once is integrated in understanding. We don't want uh, to have things that we are sure about, that we know that we regard to be like real knowledge, combined with something that might be the case, uh, something that is the result of a confusion or so on, and then low the quality of the, of the thing that is being understood. We don't want that. So scientific understanding is often regarded as the last or the ultimate goal of the scientific enterprise at epistemological level. And so we want the highest quality and we want to maintain the highest quality. Also in empirical sciences, we want this factiveness uh, condition because we want to assure that there is going to be a certain type of empirical accuracy. We want to understand things that are true about the world. And so we want to connect the theory with the world in such a way that it's reliable. And when I say I understood something about a particular empirical domain, I want to say that I understood something true about the world, through my particular uh, 
scientific theory or my particular scientific model. But I want to say that this thing that I understood is already out there and that I got a grasp of the world. And but so we have now the idea that scientific understanding might be the ultimate epistemic goal of scientific enterprise. However, it seems very like very high to reach. We have to have only true information inside of the content of understanding. And we also have to have causal explanatory uh, knowledge before. But this contrasts a lot with what we know about scientific practice. We have many cases, uh, historical cases, in which we have seen scientists deal and work with very defective information, meaning partial information, vague, conflictive, inconsistent, and false. Um, and obviously, uh, in Brazil, much work has been done on illustrating how this can be possible. We have many cases, especially on inconsistent science, that shows how scientists can reason with inconsistent information, not only because they inferentially can, but because most of the time they do not have this high quality information to work with, and they still can achieve certain types of scientific success. So. Um, one of the main challenges that we might have is how to integrate these two things. The achievement of understanding as an ultimate goal of science, as well as the use, the rational use of defective information as being very common in scientific practice. In particular, if we go back to the, uh, to the initial thoughts about Karl Heffer's claim and Juha Sati's claim, uh, we will say, okay, it's, it's also a challenge for uh, physicists in quantum mechanics. If we agree that the theories are incomplete in different senses, and that maybe um, the, the realist commitments that we have towards the theories are not going to be as strongly based or as strongly related to truth, then we also have to explain how, if in any way, uh, physicists can understand legitimately the theory um, or the theories of quantum mechanics. And so the, this is going to be the, the challenge. In order to do so, um, in order to address this challenge, I will want you to think that the following is, uh, is something that we can warrant. It, it's not like a very standard view, but it, it's also not a standard thing to do to deal with defective information and understanding together. So um, I will take understanding to be uh, to consist of building of networks that successfully connect our scientific beliefs about the world. Uh, this characterization might be taken very loosely, but imagine that the networks of scientific understanding are sets of sets of worlds. Contents are propositions, which are sets of worlds, and in, in a world, agents can relate the propositions uh, that when combined reinforce the structure of their network in that world. There's a particular way in which we can intuitively reinforce the structure of this network, and it is by eliminating new explanations or reinforcing strengthening old explanations that we have. That will help us to see how all these things that we have connect together and are glued together in order for us to get a, a more comprehensive image of the world, for instance. And so, that considered, we can say that the achievement of understanding depends upon the previous grasping of at least the relevance constrained inference relations or structural relations that hold between uh, the information that is being understood, regardless of the factivity of such information, and regardless of the character of such explanations, for instance. We may say that the explanations that we are going to get for grasping this part of the world or grasping this, uh, this part of our theory are not going to be causal. Can be geometrical, can be mechanistic, but um, so we don't care about that, but we care about grasping these relevant constraint relations and these relevant constraint explanations that, that are going to glue together um, all that we know, not only about the world, but only about our theory, but also about our theory, sorry. So how can we do this? Uh, well, we need something like a toolbox that helps us to structure the networks of understanding, that helps us to connect all this information that we regard as reliable, not necessarily as true, but as reliable, and um, to put them together in such a way that the connections are strengthened. 
and I think one of the one of the things that we could use, and maybe um, what I consider to be maybe the most resourceful um, methodology is one that is based on primitive ontology, that that takes uh, the the methodological spirit of primitive ontology. So. Which is going to be primitive ontology, as all of you know, is um, this approach provides a characterization of what it takes for a fundamental theory to be satisfactorily uh, when used to read off the metaphysics from the physics. So it's going to be a bridge between what we know about our physical theories and about our physical world to the metaphysical com uh, commitments that we can hold towards that theory. And thus, uh, the approach has to be normative, according to, um, to Valia. Because it tells what the structures, the structure proper fundamental physical theories ought to have. And this is very important, and, and we will go back to this, but um, the idea of it being normative can be, can be contextual. So what we want to say when, when we move to the achievement of understanding is that even if we cannot get an actual grasp of how is the world in, in the unique sense, we at least can know how it has to be within a particular theory, given certain type of theory. And this is going to be very important and might suffice for getting certain type of scientific understanding. And so primitive ontology enables the reconstruction or the construction, but also the reconstruction of a specific theory, introducing certain features, but especially introducing certain constraints and guidance. Um, and so it's primitive variables will not be deduced from other more fundamental notions, which is going to be the basic spirit of primitive ontology. The idea of going back to what primitiveness means, and it means that there are going to be elements that are going to be uh, the last thing that we get, that nothing is going to be behind them, and that will be grounding whatever we, we get from, from the world through them. And so um, the project is, um, concerns how the world should be, at least at the most fundamental level. Um, and that said, uh, just going very, very fast and very superficially through which are going to be the basic elements of uh, a primitive ontology methodology. Uh, first, the minimal requirement to even start this enterprise. Uh, I'm, I'm quoting uh, Balia from uh, primitive ontology in a nutshell, sorry. Um, so to even start this enterprise of inferring what the world is like from a fundamental physical theory is that there has to be something in the formalism of the theory that connects it to the world. And that is, any fundamental physical theory should have a clear ontology. This is the most important thing, and, and I will talk a bit more of why we need this, but intuitively, we need to have a clear ontology in order to understand what the hell is going on in our theory. And we don't only want it to, to have a like a better epistemic status as scientists or philosophers of science, we need to have a grasp of what is going on through the ontology. Because if not, it will be very hard for us to see uh, this theory as an empirical one, once we want to get any type of understanding. It would be very hard for us to see that this is not, uh, that if we are getting any understanding, it's not similar or closer to uh, understanding a novel than to understanding a scientific theory. And so uh, the basic of the methodology is to get, first of all, primitive variables, which are going to be formal counterparts uh, whose reference are real entities in the world, according to the theory. And so uh, these, these are going to vary uh, depending on, on the theoretical, theoretical constraints and the, uh, and the type of theory that we are working on, but the role that they play is the basic um, element of primitive ontology. And so then we need uh, some time of commitment to three-dimensionality, and a suitable primitive ontology needs to be 
but defined in three-dimensional space or space-time um, rather than being more complicated mathematical objects and two, it needs to be microscopic rather than macroscopic. And then we have to explain why it's better for it to be microscopical. And so my, there is the characteristic of it being microscopicality and in principle, primitive variables could be of any of the, of the two types could be microscopic or could be macroscopic. But we have the intuition that a microscopic primitive ontology in which primitive ontology constitutes the building blocks of everything else is able to ground a scheme that, of explanation that allows determining the properties of microscopical physical objects in terms of behavior of primitive ontology. And this is very important for the case of quantum mechanics if we regard it as a fundamental theory. So uh, if we do so, then it is very intuitive why we want the primitive and variables to be at the microscopical level. And then to tell us a story about how we get to the, to the things that we see in the world. And then you have the other elements which are not going to be, which are going to be the non-primitive ontology. And are the ones that uh, are going to emerge in, um, in a loose sense from all these constraints and the dynamics that we have. Broadly speaking, uh, the primitive variables tell us what there is and the non-primitive variables tell us, tell the primitive variables how to behave. And this is the most important thing because once we have all, all these two things together, all these two categories in a sense, working together, then it seems that we get a picture of the world. There are going to be uh, certain complaints about, for instance, the three-dimensionality requirement uh, uh, or how we choose the primitive variables. But the basic idea is that if we do it right, then we can get a very cohesive picture of what is going on in, from both sides, from what we see in the world and from what we see within our theory. Um, so there, there are going to be at least two challenges. The first one is the wave function challenge that people posit, uh, tend to posit against primitive ontology, which is what happens with wave function. If it is at the fundamental level, if it is, uh, it cannot be a primitive variable in this, like the, in the strong sense. Uh, but so if it is at the fundamental level, then everything comes from that. And, and it seems that the, the supporters of primitive ontology wouldn't want something like that. Uh, wouldn't want that that's going to be the basis and the only primitive thing that we have. Uh, on the other hand, if we assign the uh, nomic character to the wave function, then it doesn't seem so nomic in, that, uh, in, in a sense, because it will behave differently in different contexts. And we think that laws of nature wouldn't do so. And so it, it is a still uh, a need for us to explain what is going to happen with wave function in very like very sketchy and traditional versions of primitive ontology. And then if you pay attention a, lo a lot or almost every paper that is, has been written on this topic is going to provide a particular explanation of what happens in this sense. But to the general schema, that's going to be one of the, of the strongest complaints. Another complaint is going to be that uh, the agent has, has a lot of power here. The agent combined with the constraints of the specific theory. And so uh, you are not going to discover, for instance, which is going to be the set of primitive variables at the end. It's not something that you discover a posteriori, but it's rather something that you put at the initial stage. So if you constrain your model in a, in a sense, mistaken way, if you set your primitive variables wrongly, then of course, whatever comes out, it's not going to correspond to neither what happens in the, in the world, nor what should be happening uh, according to your theory. And so if, the, and another thing that we have to consider, but this, these are going to be problems for the general view, especially when going to the metaphysical side. 
Nonetheless, if we pay attention to the epistemological side related to the methodology that uh, primitive ontology will be providing, one has to go back to this statement that I, uh, that I said before, that is that we have to have a clear ontology at the fundamental level. If we think that we are working with a fundamental theory, such as quantum mechanics is supposed to be, we have to know what is going on at the ontological level. At least have, have an interpretation or have a theory, a hypothesis about what is going on at, at that moment. And so, according to Valia, if the ontology of a theory is not clear, then it's not clear what the entities of the theory, uh, the theory is assuming to exist. And then it is hard to see how one can even begin to do metaphysics. And this has to shed light on how important the other challenges are, the one about wave function and about the, the role that the agent plays. Because this might be really problematic, maybe for the metaphysician, but not necessarily for us to get a clear grasp of what is supposed to be going on in our theory and in the world. And so this idea will, um, will pull apart how problematic these things are and how useful the methodology might be for the achievement of understanding. Maybe it will be harder for us to move from having understood something to have a strong, very strong commitments about the fundamental role that uh, certain things play in the, in the grounds of the reality, but might not be so hard or so challenging to assume, okay, now I got a more cohesive picture of what should be going on right now. And so in that sense, we can, we can consider which are going to be the primitive ontology methodologies, uh, virtues at the epistemological level without going to the metaphysical commitments yet. So if one takes um, this idea that we need to, to see what is going on and we need to look at a structural, a structured version of our theory in order for us to get a grasp of which are the entities that the theory is talking about, which are going to be the dynamics and which is the role that the dynamics play uh, for the emergence of the world. Again, I'm, losing, I'm using emergence in a very loose way. Uh, then we will see that primitive ontology methodology at the epistemological level has very, very interesting uh, virtues, one of them being generality. So uh, as it often say in, in the papers uh, associated to this approach, primitive ontology is something that is often used when talking about quantum mechanics, but is independent from quantum mechanics. Ideally, we should be able to use the, uh, the approach to reconstruct different types of physical theories, at least physical theories. And so it is very general and might not depend, uh, except for the three-dimensionality requirement, might not depend on particular commitments about um, quantum mechanics and other physical theories. Then, Maria, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. We are almost in, in the time. Good. I'm, I'm, I'm almost done as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then it will provide an, a structural base for us to achieve this epistemic good, which is scientific understanding. It will enhance our explanatory power because people tend to complain about uh, primitive ontology, saying that it only provides stronger explanations about the phenomena and the ontological commitments that we might have, but it doesn't provide novel descriptions or novel, um, um, novel predictions. And Primitive ontology also helps us to integrate empirical and theoretical results in such a way that, as I was saying, the picture that we get is more cohesive. Um, and even the idea that the selection depends on the agents, priors, plus uh, the theorist constraints is very helpful if we are focusing on the epistemological level. That said, um, that is already said. So what we, what we might get from a primitive ontology based type of understanding is an understanding that help us to to see um, yes to master a specific structure within a particular domain which are going to be the domains that the theories describe uh, and what they what scientists can gain is a way to structure and follow successfully certain inferences in their day-to-day -day practice when referring to that domain and when referring to the theory 
this is not only um, that they can use inferential rules in an effective way, but also that they can explain under which circumstances and why the inferential rules are reliable in a domain of application of the theory. Because now we, we know which are the dots that are being connected, which are the, the, ontology, the ontology or the elements of the ontology that are going to be related thanks to uh, certain dynamics. For this reason, when we have these falsehoods or we have all these defective elements, uh, we have to expect that to include in the content of understanding also certain structural relations that uh, we have enlightened through, um, through the use of primitive ontology. And these patterns are going to be given thanks to the methodology, thanks to uh, the play that the role that the methodology plays in allowing us to see a particular structure and so this structure at least in a in a certain type of a spirit has to be included as part of the content of understanding mm. let's move so going back to this what we will get is something that is in the literature called model understanding which is, we don't know if that is going to be the actual picture of the world, the actual ground explanation of the world. As I was saying, to go through the metaphysical uh, side, it's going to be a bit harder, but at least we know how things will behave within that, um, within that world that is constructed through primitive ontology um, structure. And so, uh, in, in this particular case, we can see, for instance, for the case of Yuha Satsi, we can see how there are going to be or expected appropriate representational relationships holding within uh, the primitive elements that we have already uh, put forward. And for the case of Karl Hoeffer, what we will get is a, a way in which we can relate all the explanations that we have, we can strengthen those explanations, and now it seems that we can say that we have a type of knowledge that is more cohesive than the one that he is uh, willing to admit we can get in quantum mechanics. So, uh, finally, the idea is that, um, first of all, intuitively, quantum theories are defective in different senses, and people say that we should weaken our epistemic commitments toward, um, toward the interpretations that we get in quantum mechanics. And traditionally, if we get the idea that these theories are defective, we shouldn't be able to understand quantum mechanics because they are not going to be uh, satisfying either the factive condition or they are not going to be satisfying uh, the explanatory, causal explanatory condition. However, if we add the, if we employ the primitive ontology methodology, we will get certain virtues when working with a particular theory. We can, uh, we can employ a methodology that is very general and that it's not going to be ad hoc depending uh, on our purposes. We will give a structural base to our understanding. We will gain explanatory power. Uh, we will reinforce certain explanations that we had and we will integrate in a better sense, at least in, in a modal context, uh, the empirical and the theoretical results. And I think uh, this satisfactorily helps to build networks of understanding uh, of quantum mechanics theories. And there are going to be some open questions, which is the first one is how to move from having obtained certain type of understanding to assure or to strengthen our uh, metaphysical commitments. And if Actually, quantum physicists right now care about this, and maybe they do not care about understanding explicitly, but if we look at uh, Motlin's and Albert's paper on how, um, papers on how to teach quantum mechanics and the canonical representation method of, of Motlin, what we will get is what they are trying to provide us with is a methodology for us to gain a better grasp of what a theory is and how uh, these theories are going to be connected to the world. And that's ideally what understanding is doing for us. So thank you very much. I'm sorry for, uh, for talking for longer maybe. And thank you. Thank you, Maria. So we have like 10 minutes for, for discussions. Otavio, the first one, please.
And then Christian. Many thanks, uh, Maria, for the talk. I enjoyed the issues of understanding are, of course, very important. And um, even though uh, quantum physicists insist that no one understands quantum mechanics. So, um, but um, one, one question I have is on the primitive ontology approach. Um, as you pointed out, and it's, as Valia articulates, it's one feature of the approach involves the ability to read off the metaphysics from the physics. And um, now in the context of quantum mechanics, given that the theory is high, you know, fundamentally underdetermined um, by their interpretations, uh, it's unclear how you can actually do that reading, right? There are multiple incompatible interpretations of the same formalism. Uh, and depending on the interpretation you take, you get actually a very different metaphysical picture. Um, so it, in principle, it's unclear to me how to get that going. Uh, thank you, Tavi. As, as I was saying, um, I I think something that is um, that is not said often is that before getting this metaphysical reading, we have to get certain type of epistemic clarity about what we are talking about, and that's that's the only part that I am focusing in. So uh, whether you can go further and say that, okay, now this is a legitimate um, metaphysical reading of what is going on within the theory, that is an, a next step. And maybe uh, this step can be assured in certain sense, if we can explain the type of understanding that we are getting from, uh, from employing this methodology. But I, I am not telling the story of how to go from physics to metaphysics. I am telling a story of going from physics through methodology to epistemology, and then maybe you can move to metaphysics, but that's, a, that's an additional step. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So now Christian, then Valia. Yeah, the, I, I, my, my question was, was kind of in relation to, to Otavios, but I, I'm still I'm kind of puzzled. First of all, because I'm not sure I understand the, the, the idea of primitive ontology, because it, it seems to me like they're making a lot of presuppositions, physical presuppositions. So the, the, the idea of, of a of science, scientific understanding would be justifying those metaphysical presuppositions in, in a certain way. So, so, so you're starting from, 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 from some very specific ontological and metaphysical commitments. But then I, I as, as Otavio said, I, I, I don't really understand the way in which you're going to relate at the empirical theory of quantum mechanics, which everyone agrees upon more or less, apart from Romians and GRW, I mean, the, the, the empirical theory that is taught around the world to physicists. I mean, there is a, what is called standard quantum mechanics that everyone agrees upon. And then the interpretation or the ontology, which you claim is related to understanding. So how, how are you going to, to create that bridge? That it, it's kind of going in the same direction as Otavius. Maybe it's something that um, I, I missed uh, to to point out explicitly is that when one looks at um, at Kuefer's paper, which was the first uh, point from which I started going, uh, he he's thinking that quantum theories are going to be the interpretations. So uh, with that in mind, I mean there is a huge debate about how to how to consider uh, the interpretations to be, but. The, he's taking that they can be regarded as theories. So every, every single interpretation, you can regard it as a, a quantum theory. And then, okay, you are there and you say, okay, I, I will use this methodology. And while the project of primitive ontology tends to go to metaphysics and might have these assumptions about uh, what is primitive, what is the sense of primitive, for instance, um, which are going to be the relations, which is going to be the, uh, the role that the metaphysical role that the dynamics plays and the, uh, the metaphysical role that primitive ontology might play and non-primitive uh, variables might play. All this is, is going to be extra. Because ideally, uh, I mean, 
to me, it seems that all these commitments, the realist commitments and the metaphysical commitments, which are just a stronger uh, realist commitments, are after you have gotten certain type of understanding of what you are going to be committed to. And so the methodology will help you to see which are going to be the things and the relations that you might commit to. And then to move forward to the metaphysical standpoint, then you have to do something else. It's not going to suffice to have model understanding, but it's going to be very useful and maybe indispensable to have a type of understanding of what is going on within your theory. Does that help? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not really, but okay, <laughs> we, we, we'll keep we, talking. We have, we have other questions, so uh, I, I think we mo should move forward. That's you. We have for only four minutes, so please. Yes, thank you, Maria, for the very nice talk. It's nice to hear about primitive ontology, and I have uh, the doubts I have are similar to those posed by Otavio and also Christian. Then uh, you put the things in different way, in a different way. How do you, uh, objectively, how do you link the theory with the world? Because according to me, it's impossible to do that. You can just do is to link the theory with some uh, some kind of representations of parts of the world, usually done by mathematical structures. This uh, moves to the different interpretations, also, as Otavio uh, mentioned. It. Then you cannot, uh, uh, according to me at least, you cannot connect directly a theory with the world, so to say to electrons or protons or Otavios or Christians or Marias. How, you do, 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 how do you do that? The second question, the second one, in the last part of your talk, you, you move it to, uh, to, to say us, so to say that you are trying an approach to avoid, um, what's the word? Uh, not dangerous things. What do you understand by not dangerous things? Which is what would be what would be dangerous in a theory? A contradiction? These are yes. my questions. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Desia. Um, first, I, I I want to go from the last question. So one of the things that that I was saying that we want to avoid when achieving understanding, and that's the reason why we have the factive condition, is to get uh, from something that we think that is very reliable to another thing that it's less reliable. That's the reason why we want true propositions to be the content of understanding traditionally. Uh, because we want the outcome, which is going to be the ultimate goal of scientific enterprise, to be the most reliable thing that we can get. And so if you, if you incorporate these defective elements, which are going to be uh, things that you might think that might be the case but you are not sure and so on so the quality of the understanding at the end is going to be very low and that's one of the things that that you might consider to be uh, dangerous elements or dangerous results uh, of course in the case of a contradiction you may you might fear that if you don't have a good a structural constraints for that contradiction that you get more contradictions or you get something even worse uh, whatever something worst is um, and then uh, you, you might have all these challenges inferentially for related to different types of defects. That's what I meant when I said we need to avoid these this defects and this, um, these problems that might, might come later. And, and I, I do agree with you that we, we only relate our theories to representations of, of the world. So, but <laughs> yeah. But the idea is that, uh, for instance, for the achievement of understanding, when people are saying that we want our understanding to be connected to the world, what they are saying is we want our understanding, our scientific understanding of a theory or from a theory or a model to be connected with something like we can consider intuitive representations of the world that are not mediated by that particular theory or model. So thank you very much, Tassim.